was correct. And I'd just like to see if you guys have any previous knowledge about this subject, and if not, just give it your best guess. So, show of hands, how many of you think that one in 58 men and one in nine women will be raped at some point in their life? All right. How many of you think that one in 50 men, oh, yeah, one in 50 men and one in five women will be raped at some point in their life? All right. And how many of you think that one in 71 men and one in five women will be raped at some point in their life? So, whether you guessed or you knew, one in 71 men and one in five women will be raped at some point in their life. And these statistics imply that most of us will come in contact directly or indirectly with sexual violence at some point in our life. And if you look around and think about the numbers of females and males that are in this room, that implies that some of us might have had contact indirectly or directly. So just something to think about. And so our society has a generally negative stigma that surrounds sexual assault, and this has detrimental um, consequences. And this can be perceiving rape victims in negative terms, which can result in re-victimization, victim blaming, and victim shaming, and underreporting of sexual violence. And research has shown that characteristics of the victim, the perpetrator, the observer, and the situation all influence how we blame the characters who are involved in a rape. Um, so these characteristics can be the gender of the victim, the perpetrator, or the observer, their sexual orientation, their sexual history, the relationship between a victim and a perpetrator, and the consumption of alcohol. All of these things um, that are factors that are unrelated to the fact that a rape occurred influence how we blame um, those involved. And because of this research, I just want to continue this and see what other variables influence how we attribute blame towards a victim or a perpetrator. So this brought me to my research questions, which were, does the use of humanizing language in a hypothetical rape scenario influence our attribution of blame towards a rape victim or a rape perpetrator? And my independent variable um, was represented by language, and an independent variable is basically what's manipulated in a study. And I had three levels of language, humanizing, non-humanizing, and neutral language. And my dependent variable is what is affected during the study. And that was represented by attribution of blame towards a rape victim or a rape perpetrator. And I also had another question. Does the order in which participants are presented with blame scales um, affect how you attribute blame to a perpetrator or a victim of rape? And so I had another independent variable of scale order, and this was represented by two levels, victim blame scale first and perpetrator blame scale first. And I had the same dependent variables, and they were measured using the victim blame scales and the perpetrator blame scales that were created by Murdoch and Gonsal Kroc. So now I get to explain what this means. Um, so blame attribution refers to the assignment of blame that naturally occurs when people observe a social situation, usually one that has negative consequences. So for my study, um, this refers to participants' placement of blame on either the victim or the perpetrator once they had read a rape scenario. And humanizing language refers to the use of name, age, and descriptive features to describe the characters in a rape scenario. Non-humanizing language refers to the use of impersonal terminology, such as victim and perpetrator, only to describe characters in a rape scenario. And neutral language refers to the use of placeholder names like Jane Doe and John Doe, and non-descriptive pronouns to describe characters in a rape scenario. And scale order refers to the whether the participants saw a victim blame scale first or a perpetrator blame scale first. And if you aren't familiar with the term acquaintance rape, it's basically um, also known as date rape, so it just refers to a rape that was committed by someone that is known to the victim. So, you probably can't see, so I'm back over here. <laughs> so there's a fair amount of research regarding perceptions of rape, um, and someone that really got me interested in and helped me figure out exactly what I wanted to do was this guy, Bonner, who looked at linguistic features that are functional in obscuring perpetrator blame. And what he found is that there's certain language tools that um, subtly imply blame towards the victim. And so this can be using nouns versus using verbs, or using the grammatical passive voice. For example, saying the woman was raped. That puts the actor in the background and the person that was being acted upon, the victim, in the foreground. So you're thinking more about the victim, which implies more blame just because you're thinking that they have more involvement in the situation. And what he found is that distancing language is correlated with higher attribution of blame towards a victim. And so I thought it was just super interesting that something as subtle as like how we talk about it could influence how you blame someone. 
So Stromwall, Aldridson, and Landstrom looked at how the just world theory influenced attribution of blame. And if you're not familiar, the just world theory is basically this idea that there's a universal force that maintains this moral balance. So if something good happened to you, you obviously did something good to deserve it. And if something bad happened to you, you did something bad to deserve it. So victim blaming is justified under this theory by saying, well, if someone was raped, they obviously did something to deserve it. For example, if someone was raped while they're under the influence of alcohol, then they are to blame for it because they made that decision to drink alcohol. And what they found was that people who had higher belief in this just world theory attributed higher blame to a victim. And um, although there is a fair amount of research in this field, most focus on perceptions of rape victims, but Murdoch and Gonsal Corale wanted to see um, how presentation order of blame scandals influence attribution of blame towards a rape victim and a perpetrator. And so they had participants read a rape scenario and then half would respond to a, a perpetrator blame scale first and then a victim blame scale, and then half would respond to a victim blame scale first and a perpetrator blame scale second. And what they found is that when people are first presented with a perpetrator blame scale, ooh, sometimes I forget to breathe, um, they blame the perpetrator less than those who were first presented with a victim blame scale. And so I found this really interesting, so I wanted to also see how presentation order would affect my study. And I also utilized the scales that they use in their studies for mine. So I had several hypotheses, and um, a hypothesis is what we as scientists and psychologists um, state as our predictions of what we expect to happen during our studies. And we have a no hypothesis, um, which is stating that there's going to be no change, basically. And we also have an alternative hypothesis, which states that there will be some change, and usually we say what kind of change that will be. So from, I hypothesized from an attribution of blame towards a victim that the use of humanizing language in the hypothetical rape scenario would impact attribution of blame towards a rape victim. And my note would be that there would be no impact. And my hypothesis for my attribution of blame towards a perpetrator is basically the same except I changed who I was talking about. So the use of humanizing language in a rape scenario will impact attribution of blame towards a perpetrator. And my null would be that there is no change. And so for blame scale order, I hypothesized that when participants were first presented with a perpetrator blame scale, they would blame the perpetrator less than those who were first presented with a victim blame scale. And my null was that the presentation order of blame scales would have no impact on attribution, attribution of blame towards a victim or a perpetrator. So I tested 90 undergraduate students from a small liberal art, arts college wonder where that could be. <laughs> and I tested 50 males and 40 females. I was trying to test about similar numbers. Um, and I used convenient sampling, which is basically just using the resources that were available to me. And I randomly assigned uh, my participants to one of three language conditions, humanizing, non-humanizing, or neutral, and one of two scale order conditions, perpetrator blame scale first or victim blame scale first. And this was done using Excel's random number generator function and they were also offered research credit as compensation. And so due to the sensitive nature of my study, I tested my participants in small groups, and I also had a general and cautionary introduction statement which let them know that they would be reading a scenario that depicted a rape, and that they were in no way obligated to participate, and if, and if at any point they became uncomfortable, they could leave. And um, once I did that, I distributed informed consent forms, which contained general information about my study. And I also included information and contact information for the campus counselor and the National Sexual Assault Hotline, just to include as many resources as possible in the case that anything did come up for participants. And once I had reviewed and signed those, um, I distributed packets which contained blank page dividers to separate every part of the study. And they contained vignettes, which is just a fancy way of saying scenario, which had either humanizing, non-humanizing, or neutral language. And then also the perpetrator and victim blame scales, which were manipulated depending on which condition they were in. And I also included a word search because I just wanted to give the participants a confidential way to opt out um, in case they were uncomfortable letting me know they didn't want to participate or anyone around them. And I also had test dividers set up, again, to just ensure confidentiality in any way I could. So the perpetrator blame scale had eight questions which were posed on a seven-point Likert scale, 
and responses range from one strongly disagree to seven strongly agree. And the victim blame scale had the same eight questions with one additional question, except it was changed to target the victim. And the data was nominal and discrete, and it was first sorted by language condition and then by scale order condition. And so how I interpreted this, um, my results, I used two two-way ANOVAs, which is a form of statistical analysis that allowed me to compare the difference in averages between my blame scale scores among language condition and skill order condition. <coughs> and so these graphs represent my pattern of results. So the black bars indicate victim blame scale scores, and the gray bars, in, or blue-ish, indicate perpetrator blame scale scores. And victim blame scale scores range from 9 to 63, and perpetrator scores range from 8 to 56. And the, these numbers are the averages for each condition, and these bars are error bars, which represent the standard deviation. And so, as psychologists and scientists, when we conduct the, this research, we are looking for a significant difference, or a lack of a significant difference. And what this basically means is a measurable difference between groups that's due to the experimental manipulation and not due to random chance. So I was looking at a measurable difference in blame scale scores. And I did not find a significant difference between victim blame scale scores or perpetrator blame scale scores among all language conditions. And you can visually see this just by the fact that these all kind of look the same. So this is my graph for scale order. And I did find a significant difference between perpetrator blame scale scores and scale order. And so what this means is that there was it might not look very significant on this visual representation, but you can see the slight difference between averages. So what the heck does this all mean? So what, once we have analyzed um, our results, we say that we either reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And I failed to reject my null hypothesis for language condition. Um, regarding language, and this just means that the use of humanizing language in an acquaintance rape scenario has no impact on attribution of blame towards a victim or a perpetrator. And I did reject my null hypothesis regarding scale order, which means um, that when participants were first presented with the perpetrator blame scale, they blamed the perpetrator less than those who were first presented with the victim blame scale. And there are some limitations to my study. I only used a uh, female victim and a male perpetrator because this is the most common gender combination. And future studies could look at um, a variety of different gender roles. Um, for example, using a male victim and a male perpetrator or a male victim and a female perpetrator or a female victim and a female perpetrator. And I also use an acquaintance rape scenario because that's the most common type of rape that occurs. But future studies could all also look at how varying the type of rape while still using humanizing language could impact attribution of blame. So using a stranger rape scenario or a relation, uh, rape that occurs within a relationship and seeing how that impacts it. And even though I didn't find um, humanizing language had any impact on attribution of blame, I still think the results from this study and the potential for future studies could help our society to evaluate what language should be used to describe sexual assault in various settings such as sexual education, counseling, and legal proceedings. And based on the results that the order in which um, questions about a victim or a perpetrator rape influences attribution of blame, I think that should be taken into consideration in real life scenarios like when police are questioning a witness of a sexual crime. Should they be asking questions about the victim first or the perpetrator first? And future studies can look at how the presentation order of a victim and a perpetrator just verbally influences attribution of blame. And sexual abuse is a taboo topic, which results in a lack of conversation and education, which can lead to prolonged suffering for victims and other consequences. And I know as a survivor of sexual violence myself that these consequences are real. And I myself didn't report what happened to to me and didn't seek help because I was afraid of what people would think and the judgments that would be made. And I didn't share my personal experience with you in the beginning of this talk, um, even though it was what initially got me interested in the subject because I did not want you to see me as a victim and perceive what I had to say differently. 
And so just by understanding the different subtle and not so subtle variables that influence how we perceive rape, we can do our part in reducing re-victimization and victim blaming. And just by having a conversation, we're already doing our part in changing this negative stigma that surrounds this topic. And ideally, by making it a more normal topic, we can also reduce the frequency in which it actually happens in our society. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to start this conversation, and I appreciate you all being here to be a part of it. Um, thank you. things to say and I hope you enjoy everyone's posters. They're all very uniquely interesting and important. So thank you. Woo! Yeah! Yeah. So I won't keep you guys too long. Please go take a look at our posters out there. There are 10 projects and I hope